right, I guess we'll just dive right into it. So first we have um, Vincent Bergeron from the University of Ottawa. Fantastic. Okay, so we've been talking about it uh, quite a bit. We've been trying to find these stable or selective uh, relationships, structure functional relationships, ideally one-to-one -one mappings. Instead, what we found is strong evidence of one-to-many mappings. So here's two explanations. Uh, they're not all the explanations there are, but two of the main explanations. The first one, brain structures do something different, uh, and by this I mean different operations locally um, for each or at least some of the different types of cardiac functions in which they participate. Uh, so uh, Michael Anderson has uh, argued for this view, and he has offered neuromodulation as a possible mechanism for why uh, this could happen. Although I don't think he's quite happy with my picture of this argument. You can always change it. Second uh, explanation is the one I'm going to pursue in the, in the poster. Our cognitive ontologies are either incorrect or too coarse. Uh, brain structures might each perform a kind of operation, and by this, this could be a you know, small structure, it could be a network structure, uh, that can be recruited by different types of cognitive functions. Uh, so here, there could be a possibility of one-to-one -one mappings. Uh, but the problem is that we just don't have proper descriptions for those operations. So the start, uh, the beginning of my project is this uh, assumption, what I call the cognitive continuity thesis. Uh, the basic building blocks of human cognition are shared across a wide range of species. Uh, I don't think this is too controversial. So uh, the proposal will be that we should think of these, uh, we could think of these building blocks as cognitive homologies. And so a cognitive homology is the operations of a homologous structure. So we've talked about homologous structures. And I'm going to argue that cognitive homologies are good candidates for stable structure functional relationships, uh, and that they can be used to construct new cognitive homologies. So you can think of a, a, an alternative title as carving up the mind at its homologous choice. That's, that's the project. All right, thank you. And now I have Daniel Bernstein from Tulane University. Uh, thanks. So standard approaches to function and representation in information processing or box and arrow psychology I think are broadly committed to this philosophical idea of consumer semantics, which basically says that you have a producer of a representation that stands in some privileged informational relationship to the world, encodes that information, and then sends it on so that other parts of the mind can use that representation to perform their function. Um, I think there are several problems with this idea when we look at the brain. I'm going to talk about two, the, co the distributionality and context sensitivity of brain function. Uh, so in my dissertation, I argue for a context sensitive approach to function and representation uh, in the brain. Um, and I think that this is a problem because if you need to refer to the entire brain or some large chunk of the brain to establish a representation, then this seems to undermine the explanatory priority of these consumption relationships in terms of explaining how psychology works. Um, so I'm going to articulate this with uh, two modern approaches to neural coding, uh, multivariate pattern analysis and multiplexing. These assess representation because they talk about how information is encoded and decoded or, or can be decoded in, uh, in neural activity. Uh, but despite this encoding and decoding talk, I'm going to argue that consumption relationships are uh, uh, precisely the wrong way of understanding uh, how representation is implemented. And I'm going to argue that representation is inherently a network effect rather than networks being explained by interactions of representations. Great, thank you. And now we have David Colasso from the University of Pittsburgh. Hello, yes, my poster will be on the identification of scientific phenomena focusing on phenomena of the life sciences. Um, I will specifically look at the strategies by which researchers both ascertain elements of phenomena as well as uh, test and revise their understanding of phenomena uh, strategies in which we can test repeatability, stability via replications and modulations of experimental techniques. Uh, for this uh, kind of a, a conference, I'm very interested in the way in which uh, you know, revising our understanding of phenomena can help us rethink the taxonomy of something like psychology. One of my case studies will focus on spatial reinforcement learning, coming from a lab at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, which is at the intersection of cognitive neuroscience and cognitive psychology. Uh, there we see a kind of behavioral paradigms working concurrently with uh, reductive uh, localization paradigms in order to both, under, both determine uh, what the character of the phenomenon is, its elements, and uh, ways in which we can revise our understanding of the phenomenon of spatial reinforcement learning, as well as uh, what might be underlying it in terms of uh, neurologically plausible networks for it. Uh, I'd be very uh, excited to talk to people about 
more about you know the phenomena that they seek to understand in their techniques and in, in their practices and how uh, the strategies both kind of identify them and maybe ultimately explain, model, and theorize about them. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so now we have uh, Mathieu DeWitt from Moss Rehabilitation Research Institute. Okay, hi everybody. Um, I'd like to say very briefly a little bit, not only about my course, but also about myself. Uh, so, uh, in grad school, I was trained as a, an experimental slash ecological psychologist, studying basic motor behaviors like uh, grasping and reaching behaviorally. Uh, currently, I'm a, doing a postdoc uh, with Laurel Buxbaum in Philadelphia, uh, where I study the neural instantiation of more high-level motor behaviors such as tool use in uh, stroke patients. Uh, so for a long time, uh, uh, psychologists, most, many if not most psychologists and, and neuroscientists um, have attempted to, uh, so to speak, uh, carve the brain at its joints uh, as they have been prescribed by uh, cognitivist approaches to um, behavior and cognition. Um, and, um, I'm, 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 I'm bothered by this both because of my ecological background and also uh, because I'm very excited about the idea of this workshop, which is that we should try to let the brain tell us what its joints are. And so uh, in, able, in order to do that, um, we need to expose the brain to various task situations um, and then uh, try to let a story emerge. Um, <coughs> and. Um, so my poster is going to be, uh, 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 it's going to argue that uh, when, we, when we construct these task situations, uh, uh, we, we take a pluralistic approach, uh, sort of pluralistic approach to, to neuroscience, uh, um, sorry, <laughs> I'm losing my train here. Um, pluralistic approach, so uh, not just sort of tasks designed within the cognitivist uh, perspective, but also within the ecological perspective. Um, and um, this is because I think that uh, the, the recent evidence for neural reuse is actually, uh, might actually be much more consistent with the uh, ecological way of looking at cognition and behavior than with the cognitivist way. Um, finally, I wanna briefly uh, mention that uh, uh, my postdoc is, uh, is coming to an end uh, at, the end, uh, uh, at the end of the summer and uh, that I would really like to continue to ask these kinds of questions, do this, kinds of do this kind of research uh, in a second postdoc and another job opportunity. So if you're interested or if you know of any leads, uh, <laughs> I'd, be, uh, I'd be very happy to hear about them. Thank you. And next up we have Joseph McCaffrey with the University of Pittsburgh. Hi, uh, I'm Joe. I'm a grad student at Pitt HPS, and <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about in my poster is the use of functional MRI in order to test our cognitive ontologies, which is a broad topic that I've explored a lot uh, in some recent work, and we've seen a lot of ways that cognitive ontology revision uh, might be motivated by fMRI findings. Uh, in this uh, poster, I'm just going to look at the use of uh, multivoxel pattern analysis and other pattern classification techniques to discriminate uh, different uh, tasks and uh, how that then licenses or doesn't license inferences to the constructs underlying those tasks. And so McDonald and uh, Leary, um, in, a, in a sort of standard paper, argue that pain and social rejection are actually the same kind of psychological process based on neural overlap. And then more recently, uh, neuroscientists like Wu uh, and Torwager uh, have been able to discriminate those using MVPA and then argue that in fact pain isn't just a form, you know, social rejection isn't a form of somatic pain. So I'm going to raise two issues uh, just for uh, can, whether or not MVPA can discriminate uh, brain states. Uh, and so one is the presence of additional constructs that may be driving uh, discrimination uh, in a way. So I'm arguing here that standard JLM analyses kind of have controls like cognitive subtraction that often aren't used in MVPA designs. And the second, which is a bit more conceptual, is what I call implementation uh, differences. And the idea that we can, we, we can actually drive discrimination, uh, say between someone seeing a basketball and seeing a baseball, in cases where we don't think that there's, we have no reason to think there are really different kinds of cognitive processes taking place and explore whether that's kind of a reductio, the use of discrimination for, to drive cognitive ontology revision. Uh, next we have Jorge Morales from Columbia University. Yep. Thanks. Um, in my poster, I discuss the idea that uh, when cognitive 
a comparative cognitive psychologist uh, go and test animals, other animals for mental functions, they do uh, one of two things. Either they are testing like very uh, human-like complex higher uh, functions, and basically the question is, do animals have these type of mental states or uh, mental functions? Uh, another thing that uh, comparative psychologists might do, uh, especially if they are neuroscientists, they will be trying to see how certain mechanisms work in the brain, and for certain type of experiments, they use animal models for learning that. That when they do that, they usually do very basic uh, uh, mental uh, or cognitive processes like uh, vision, for instance. Uh, and sometimes, or more recently, perhaps, uh, some neuroscientists have done both of them uh, at the same time. So for instance, I, I, I talk about metacognition as a, a case study uh, where scientists try to both at the same time learn whether, for instance, macaques have certain type of metacognition and at the same time try to infer uh, what's the mechanism behind it. Um, and what, I, uh, what I, I argue is that um, we can do that, but we need uh, certain constraints. And one of them are having very clear formal models that allow us to link um, physiology, behavior, and uh, the, psychology, the psychological functions that we're testing. And we have to consider the evolutionary context in which, uh, you know, just to know which types of animals we're testing. Uh, some metacognitive <coughs> tests have been done with uh, rats and with macaques, and those two can't be interpreted in the same way. And finally, I talk about functional homologies and how we can attribute homologous functions, uh, complex mental functions to other animals. Uh, so finally, I, I conclude that uh, we can both attribute uh, new functions or high cognitive functions to other animals when we use this these strategy, at the same time that we can rethink our own mental functions in light of what we discovered uh, in other species. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next, we have Sophia Ortiz with MIT. Hi everybody, so I'm a philosopher and my dissertation is on imagination. And there have been several people in the literature in the past few years who've argued that there is no such thing. Um, uh, well, that, that's, that's not quite true. They've said something like, it's just too heterogeneous a thing, there are too many processes that we call imaginings. Or they've said things like, well, imaginings, like this particular process of imagining is really just this thing we've been describing, this other area. There's no need to talk about it as like a special thing. That would be really bad for me, because it's the subject of my dissertation. If I have nothing to study, I would be very unhappy. So I decided I had to write this paper, um, which is the subject of this poster. And the main claim that I make uh, in this paper is that imaginings can be unified as, as a category. There's a way that we can productively talk about them together um, if we classify them partly by what epistemic role they play. So how they're helping us get knowledge or beliefs or revise our beliefs or um, acquire new suppositions, you know, things like that. Um, so here's an example of uh, a case where I think you can use your imagina imagination productively to learn something. And I think that uh, the role it's playing is slightly different from the role of other processes that are described as different epistemic things. So I, I think it's distinct from operations of memory exclusively. I think it's distinct from operations of, say, offline perception, which some people talk about in philosophy. I think that's not a great way to put it. Um, and I also think it's different from uh, inferential processes in some ways. And I can talk to you more about that if you come see my classroom. So thank you. It's my pleasure to invite Luca Grusik up from Duke University. Hi. Um, so I'm Luca from Duke University, and I've been exploring uh, data from Neurosynth with my advisors, Felipe de Brugard and Scott Patel. Um, so you heard about Neurosynth earlier, but briefly, again, it's a framework uh, for doing massive meta-analysis on fMRI literature. Um, and it tells us, um, uh, so the, on the data of terms from fMRI papers and then the peak coordinates of activation reported in those papers, so it tells us a lot about the relationship between terms and regions of the brain. And what we're wondering here is whether it can also tell us about relationships between those terms. Uh, so both of the approaches that are presented on the poster start with a decomposition of the data uh, in which we get a set of spatial patterns um, 
and for each of the terms we get a loading across that set of spatial patterns uh, and the two approaches we've taken to uh, making some sense of that is looking for some sort of property or metric across those loadings by which we can sort the terms and make some uh, some claims about either the, the ordering or relationships uh, between the terms and we've also performed uh, a hierarchical clustering analysis looking for relationships uh, between larger sets of those terms. Um, if this sort of uh, say density of data is unappealing to you, I should come by the poster where we don't actually present any of these, but rather our attempts to make sense uh, of all of it. Uh, and if this sort of data is appealing to you, you should come by uh, and share your ideas about how we've been thinking about it and how we could think about it. So, um, if you also first who are interested in the scientific research on mental disorders, often involve the question of whether mental disorders are natural kinds or not. And this is primarily because uh, mental disorders are, uh, sorry, natu natural kinds are taken to be the fundamental building blocks of any scientific activity. Uh, and a, a predominant supposition in the philosophy of psychiatric literature goes something like this. If mental disorders are natural kinds, then we can study them scientifically. In other words, the idea or whether or not we can, the empirical investigation of mental disorders hinges upon their status as natural kinds. So in this paper, I decouple these two questions, whether mental disorders are uh, natural kinds, a different kind of question from whether and how we can study mental disorders scientifically. And uh, I argue that we don't have to settle the, mental, the natural kind status of mental disorders to do empirical research on mental disorders. And I use schizophrenia um, as an illustration to uh, some of these arguments. And lastly, Earl, Jesse Graves. Thanks. Uh, so uh, I'm interested in uh, this idea of using the brain to inform our cognitive taxonomy of the mind, or the psychology, sort of the brain first meta-analysis kind of stuff that uh, Russ Poldrack was talking about this morning. Um, so I'm going to start off, I start off by, I feel like it's important to remind ourselves that, that partly what we're involved in here is adding a new variable or component to the, the concepts that we're working with. And so once you bring brain data to, to bear on your psychological taxonomy, I think it's helpful to think of working uh, now in sort of a neurocognitive taxonomy. Um, it's something kind of different. And then um, based on some, uh, so, so yeah, and then the idea is that we're, we can use things like these pattern classification analysis techniques to try and see if we can discriminate between uh, these psychological concepts using what data we have on the brain. Um, so based on some work that I'm involved with in a memory lab, looking at representations in and near the hippocampus, uh, we've run into some problems with making inferences about the representational content of the signal just on the basis of pattern classification analysis. And then we've got some clever solutions to that um, in looking by looking for ways that the representations break down, because representations can be false. Um, and then I conclude the poster by thinking about how these considerations translate into challenges for meta-analysis approaches and raise a bunch of questions that I don't have any <laughs> Please join me in thanking all of these people for knocking out the parking today.